us. And uh, today we have a special treat. We have uh, Ms. Dawn Parker coming from Chicago uh, to speak to us about PCAS, Research Concrete Management uh, Projects, uh, Managing Projects, and uh, Material is special. And uh, most of us are familiar with it now from various reasons or various uh, venues, either the trip that we had last week or before that, or your own uh, experiences. Today she will uh, summarize lots of information to us to uh, see how we manage this uh, fascinating material. I call it fascinating. And I will always say it is a material for the 21st century. So uh, would you please join me in uh, welcoming Dawn. Thank you. Thank you. So do you want to talk a little bit before we get started about um, MSCI as I go through the presentation, maybe each of you think of a question that has to do with construction management and how that might be applied. Very good. Thank you. Uh, you touched on something very good that this class is engaged in what we call PAM items, the elements that without which, any of which, there's no project. PAM items. And each student is writing actually a research on this. P for people, V, M for materials, M for money, S for site, and so forth. So everybody, please put this in the back of your minds while she's talking about this material. And this material is different a little, or a little bit more than a little, uh, from the traditional uh, rebar uh, concrete that's a slab on grade or a typical uh, beam column thing, because it is precast also. And the, then the steel is different. And the steel is pre-stressed, so there are lots of differences in this. And if you don't mind, if we can just spend 30 seconds around a drawing just to get a feel of it. So would you please leave your comfort zone and come with us to the back of the room for a second. And we will look at a precast stress concrete project. We are familiar with these from other classes. Here is a typical uh, precast stress concrete project. And uh, as you'll see, it is very similar and very different at the same time. So uh, similar from the aspect of the axes and the main components. But uh, when you look here, you'll find that the pieces of the building are precast and pre-stressed, prepared in a plant. And uh, people are working under good conditions, be it snowing outside, they are in a, a closed environment, and they build uh, whatever they are building or pouring and preparing it for shipping. And shipping is another story for uh, managing uh, your, uh, your uh, shipments. And then uh, getting to the site. So whoever is writing about uh, site, you can add something about a precast research concrete site in the plant, where to, to do things and where to uh, build them. So you find pieces like a leak, we call it, or uh, something you build uh, piece by piece So you get this wall as a number, you get it as is, by crane, put it here, and put this with this, and the building can go in a week or something like that. very uh, fast and very time uh, sensitive. So just keep this in the back of your mind while uh, Ms. Parker is giving us whatever she is going to share with us. I am with Precast Pre-Stress Concrete Institute of Illinois and Wisconsin. And basically what that means is I represent these 15 producers of precast concrete. And when I say I represent them, we are an association that comes together and promotes the industry. So we're promoting precast, we're learning about the industry, we're discovering best practices, business practices. Um, I work a lot with the Departments of Transportation in Illinois and Wisconsin, the Tollway Authority, um, architects, engineers, students, universities, um, but it's all about precast concrete and all of these that are listed up here are certified precast producers. So we'll talk about the certification process a little bit at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to let you click those slides for me if you don't mind. So today, um, in relation to precast concrete, we're going to look at what a high-performance structure is, talk about some of the advantages and long-term benefits of high-performance design, um, describe, describe how precast concrete contributes to 
design versatility, energy efficiency, and long-term building performance, and explain the concept of resiliency and how high-performance design incorporates it into multi-hazard protection. We have a couple of um, videos we're going to show you a little bit later as well. So you guys have all been in construction management and in the construction industry long enough, you know what concrete is, right? I don't have to describe this slide to you. So we all know what concrete is, but what's precast concrete? So did all of you go to county last week to the field trip to county materials? Or any other one trips. Yeah. Is that plant? So you've seen a plant production somewhat. I can tell you the, the different, those 15 producers names that I showed you, um, it varies. So some are outside production, some are inside production. They have an inside line, um, huge facilities. And so the, the precaster kind of varies. So basically what precast concrete is, is concrete that's cast anywhere else other than its final position. So you could say tilt up is precast concrete. However, what we're talking about today is not tilt up. It is precast concrete. It's manufactured in another location and then brought and assembled at its building site. The nice thing about manufacturing off-site, again in the certified plants, is there's a huge level of consistency in the product. Okay, so pre-stressing. You guys see a little bit about pre-stressing at County Materials last week. Did, did you want to show them how that yes. worked and how it put it together? This is a regular rebar that you are familiar with compared to the stranded thing here. If you look, you see seven strands that has this round so you see it and feel it. And uh, don't get fooled by the diameter of it because the material itself is much stronger than this one. And this one is stressed after the fact, after you strip the form. This one is stripped before you pour concrete and uh, the elongation is quite dramatic. For example, uh, those of you who went to the 60 feet uh, bed, you can have as elongation from the here to here. For example, you saw the man measuring as, as this. And this becomes like elastic band. Pour concrete on it, and uh, here is one of the size of the head of the bed, and here is three pond thing here, and three things. I pass this around, and they put this somewhere here. I hope to work like this. So I have it like this. There is a rubber band here, if you like, and then it uh, looks like a cone, and this is like a cone also. So I put this inside this, like this, I guess. This way, then you can imagine that. See, it will snug like this. And then you have this thing here, you put it from the other side, here I guess. And uh, there was this spring, and you tighten, tighten, so this will be one piece from this side, and you have a big uh, a piece of uh, steel from the other side. Then you can imagine when they pull, it's, it's really for 60 feet, when you have two feet, uh, or one foot and a half, it's quite a elongation. So under severe tension here, you pour concrete, and then the next day when it cures, you cut by a torch, so the rubber band, quote unquote, rubber steel, <laughs> then would, would to go back. So when it goes back, it compresses the concrete, <coughs> even to have, uh, even the camera, mm -hmm. the camera, you can look at it and see it like this. So when it is loaded, it becomes flat, as if uh, zero splash or something. So that's the glory of the material. Right, so as Professor said, there's, those two methods, right? You can pre-stress it, or pre-tension it, or post-tension it. So again, pre-tensioning <coughs> is putting the wire in, tensioning in it before it's cast, and then cutting it after it's cured. And then post-tensioning means putting the strands in um, after the concrete is cast. And then those strands are placed into tubes, and there's an anchor on each end that tensions it. For the one that's post-tension, uh, do you uh, put sleeves or uh, Leaves and put the, the, uh, the this rubber and the bars inside. And then after you pour the concrete, or actually, put this in so after you pour concrete, these are not touching the concrete yet, so they are free. So after the concrete hardens, you post tension, and then you fix and fix, and then you grout around it, so uh, the sleeve will be full of. So let's look at a little bit, um, some of the elements of pre-stressed concrete. Um, many benefits 
relevant to traditional concrete? I mean, we've all seen concrete poured in driveways or poured on sidewalks. But the benefit of pre-stressing it is it increases that load carrying capacity that we were talking about. Um, it also allows for greater spans, so you can get longer spans, um, less or no cracks, and it can reduce the section size and therefore reduce the weight. Um, and again, that often depends upon your project's design and needs, and you can utilize a combination of those benefits. So some of the elements of precast we're going to look at today are precast concrete is architectural. Um, it can be used for building envelopes and other applications, as well as a structural system for parking structures and bridges. As you can see there, well, there you go. Um, so architectural, you see the pretty and the outside, as well as structural and a combination of both. <clears throat> Some of the elements of um, precast are a load-bearing architectural spandrel, as you can see in A, um, an extension column, as, or I'm sorry, an exterior column as seen as in B, doubled core or hollow core plank, as shown here in C, uh, interior columns, inverted B, or inverted E team, ugh, I can't even speak, inverted T, beam or composite beam, which I don't even see E on there. Ah, there we go. And then um, shear walls, stairs. So it kind of gives you an idea of the different elements that can be used structurally for precast. Uh, next, we're going to look at some of the <clears throat> different types of walls using precast. So the first one over there on the left is a solid wall. Usually these are four to eight inches thick and they're a single wide of concrete. The middle is the insulated sandwich wall panel. Typically these are two wides of concrete, so an interior and an exterior with a rigid insulation in between. Um, the thickness of each of those wides, again, is going to vary depending upon your project design. And then the final is thin shell which consist of one exterior width of concrete, typically one and a half to three inches thick, and supported by a frame system, which most times is usually made of steel. Um, and some of the uh, thin shell systems can also incorporate um, insulation. These walls can either be load-bearing or non-load-bearing, and so you can transfer your roof and your floor loads to them. And these um, can also come in many different shapes, really uh, are only limited by shipping requirements. So when talking about shapes, these that you see here are typically some of the more common shapes that precast walls come in. So window walls, these are typically your larger wall sections. Um, they can span one or more stories. They're designed to fully encompass your fenestration elements, such as windows, and sometimes they're referred to as a closed panel concept. Um, secondly, you've got spandrels, and these are typically your rectangular sections that span from column to column. Um, they're often used in parking structures or with win ribbon window designs. And then you see a lot of smaller types of uh, precast shapes that can be used in mullions and column covers. So looking at the wall types, we're going to look at a couple of projects that show the different types of uh, wall construction. This is a solid wall construction. And on this side, also a solid wall construction. But as you can see, let's see. There's a gray concrete mix in the back, and then the front is your architectural precast concrete. That's all concrete. But by using that um, mix in the back, you get a little bit less expensive um, and reduction of cost in the panel production. <clears throat> so this is an example of a project using solid wall construction. This is the Perot Museum in Dallas, Texas. And um, this was actually, and we're going to talk a little bit later, this was actually, it's, it's as cast concrete, and it was using um, form liners to get that look. 
So insulated sandwich wall panels, again, your two wise of concrete with the solid uh, insulation in the middle. Um, the thickness of the concrete is going to vary from project to project depending upon how the panel was designed, how the architect designed it. These walls can be designed to work either compositely, which means the two wise of concrete work together to resist the load and provide your shear wall transfer or your shear transfer between the wise and that will reduce your wall thickness. But they can also be designed to be non-composite, which means the two Ys are working independently to resist the load. Um, or they can be partially composite, which is somewhere between the two providing your shear uh, transfer. This picture is not a solar cell, right? It's not solar? It's not a solar cell. No. It's a wall, this thickness, and the Thin, thin brick or that's probably thin brick yeah so here's a project showing um, precast with insulated sandwich wall panels I mean by looking at it, it looks like any other very nice building you can't tell that the insulated sandwich wall panels were used but that's a dormitory in Washington DC so another type of wall is the thin shell that we talked about and you can see some examples here of thin shell walls. Um, and in this one here, you can see it's using steel as the reinforcement. And on this one is a concrete foundation. Those can also incorporate uh, insulation as well. So a type of thin shell is, and it's pretty new to our industry, is glass fiber reinforced concrete. So in this application, the concrete wide is sprayed into the form and that concrete contains glass fiber reinforcement. As you can see in the left picture, that's glass fiber reinforced concrete and it's on a steel frame. And the nice thing about the glass fiber reinforced concrete is it really allows you to get these extremely ornate details as seen on, in this picture on that building. That's all precast concrete. It is, it's finding a lot of applications in historical renovation because you can get this type of detail that you see on a lot of the historic buildings. So here's a building actually, um, an office building that's used glass fiber reinforced concrete. Okay, let's talk a little bit about structural precast and some of the elements of structural precast. So, in this picture, you can see um, columns and beams, inverted double T's, hollow core plank. This hollow core plank is typically used as roof and flooring systems, and it's a huge insulator. Um, and of course, the weight is much less because of the hollow core. And no, county doesn't produce that. But that's a very interesting product to see produced in the plant. Um, there's a couple, couple of different ways. Some of them use an extruder machine um, and barrel through and it cuts through the um, concrete. Here's stair systems made out of precast. You see those a lot in parking garages. And this is a light wall system built out of precast. So those are just some of the structural elements. I mean, you can imagine if you do this uh, cast in situ with the stairs, mm -hmm. how long would it take to get the form? form. Right, or right. Enforcement and, right. and pouring concrete and stripping the floor. But now you get it. Take it. it and you are next put floor. it in and it's built. Um, so, on the structural systems, this kind of gives you an idea of exterior shear wall systems using precast and then your interior shear wall system. Precast can also be used, designed, or be designed with as a frame system, um, including moment resistant, resisting frames, which is going to eliminate your shear walls. So we're going to go through now and look at a couple of project applications. Um, project or precast is so versatile that a lot of people don't realize that it is built out of precast. Okay, so. Precast is used for all types of buildings, so office buildings, um, this is a university building, high-rise living, um, shopping centers, retail, entertainment, public and institutional, 
you can see here the Lucas Oil Stadium. I can tell you the Bush Stadium. They just did the renovation. It is precast. Are any of you Cardinals fans? You're not very okay. I'll forgive you for that. I'm not either. Um, so Bush Stadium is made out of precast since they did the renovations. Um, this is an institutional, a lot of, uh, not institutional, I'm sorry, correctional facility. A lot of correctional facilities, the new ones are being built in precast. Um, this is a data center. And the nice thing about, uh, we're seeing a lot more precast being produced in data centers. And we're going to show you a video here in a little bit that will explain why precast is kind of a choice. I mean, data centers are like our entire global brain anymore and we have to protect that data so we're going to show you a video that kind of shows how precast does that and then it precast can also be used as a sculptural element as seen in that waterfall with this uh, prism uh, real thing it comes uh, complete with the fixtures mm -hmm. the plumbing the electrical everything is in place yeah it, it, it. set it down and you can do two stories mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So here's an example of some parking structures. Over half of the parking structures in the U.S. are made out of precast, um, including mixed-use applications. So you can see here, this is, this is just a parking garage. That is just a parking garage. But here you can see where there's retail in the bottom, um, mixed-use applications. You can see in these two bottom pictures how they've really designed the parking facilities to blend in with the rest of the area. I will mention about this retail thing. Uh, they have a retail here, and this is a library. And you can see the back of the books. They made uh, special forms to look like books. Mm -hmm. The library looks like books. I don't know if that picture is big enough that they can see that. So another uh, area that precast, in fact, most of the bridges in the US, both short and long span, are made out of precast. This here is a newer product for precast that we're becoming much more innovative in. This is a curved U-girder. Um, Illinois Tollway is now specking U-girders in a couple of their projects, so we'll see that this year. Um, sound walls is, is another thing that precast is used much for. And replacement pavers, and the reason why precast is so nice and that many of the IDOT or the departments of transportation and the tollways like this so much is they can shut down a single lane of traffic, cut out the pavement that needs to be repaired or replaced, plop in a precast pavement, open the lane of traffic and it's been shut down from 18 to 24 hours and they've cut traffic back on that pavement. So huge, huge benefit to the transportation. So we're going to go real quickly through high performance and what a high performance structure is and how precast fits into that. So U.S. government defines high performance structure as one that integrates and optimizes on a life cycle basis all major high performance attributes. So including everything from energy conservation, safety, security, productivity, sustainability, and operational considerations. So there are several components of this that we're going to look at here really quickly. So the first thing is, we all here talk about sustainability, right? I mean, it's kind of the buzzword, green building, sustainability. The first thing is, is that sustainability is a part of high performance. And all the procedures and the practices that the precast industry has developed over the past 10 to 15 years are included. So in other words, high performance is a larger umbrella, if you will, that encompasses sustainability and more. The second part of high performance structure is that it integrates and optimizes on a life cycle basis all. Not just some, not just a this or that approach, but it's all of these high performance attributes. That's very important to know. The third thing is, is high performance looks at the performance of the structure for the long term and not just first costs. So as you guys get into project, project management, um, you know, you're going to be looking at, okay, what's this building cost versus this building cost? And so a high performance structure is looking at a structure beyond your first day cost to start operation. It's looking at a building that's going to last 50, 60, 70, 100 years. So we're going to skip 
like that. So um, <clears throat> we have, what we've done is taken this, this definition and chopped it into like three areas, versatility, efficiency, and resiliency. And precast inherently provides many of the attributes and their related uh, benefits. When we look at versatility, we're looking at versatility in the aesthetic. So what, what can be done with the outside of the building? How can it look? We're looking at that as well as in the design and in the structure use. In efficiency, we're looking at um, efficiency in design, in construction, and throughout the operations of the building. And finally, in resiliency, we're going to be looking at long-term durability and safety. And high-performance materials provide all three of those overriding areas. So let's look at aesthetic versatility. So many times when architects or owners have their projects designed, they're looking for a building that blends in, right? On this college campus, if somebody was going to go place a new building here, most likely they would want to build it to match the existing facade of the other buildings. And that's what this is. This is a um, uh, rec center and dormitories on the North Central College campus in Naperville, Illinois. And it was designed to fit in with buildings that have been on that campus 80, 90, 100 years. So it blends in. They're also used to stand out. So a lot of times, you know, architects want to build that iconic piece and that piece that, or that building that stands out. This is another university building on Penn State University. It's a uh, classroom and life science labs. So let's look real quickly at how we get that colored concrete. And precast can come in literally an almost endless array of colors um, through several different methods. So on, up here you've got your aggregate, which can be used to get your color. And then you have your cement um, or colored pigments. This American flag is a precast, and it's just really pretty much was made to show that you can get so many different color variations, um, but that's just a sculpture made out of precast. So, um, precast has also several finish options to help you get those colors and get that finish you're looking for um, to mimic other products. So, up here is, is precast as cast, right? It comes straight out of the forms, it's concrete, it's gray. There's, you know, it's very nice, very smooth, but it's concrete. You can also use it to get exposed <coughs> aggregate to give you a different color. And this um, is achieved by using a chemical surface retarder. So the, the concrete's poured, it's sprayed with a chemical surface retarder, and then the cement sets, and then the next day, the top layer really is removed um, with water blasting, and it gives you this exposed aggregate look. Another uh, aesthetic that you can achieve is with acid etching, and it usually kind of ex it gives you that light to medium exposure, um, and it provides a darker surface, as you can see up there. And then finally, you've got abrasive blast, and that's usually done by sandblasting. And all of them the same? All the same materials. Taken this way? Right. So. This, this, this probably doesn't have the colored aggregate in it, but this one, this one, and this one, same materials, just different methods of finishing the material. So precast is a cast material in different forms or molds, and it, it allows for a variety of shapes and reveals, and you can see here, um, they used it to create a large scale image. And you can see, go back real quick, the, this is a one manufacturer that does architectural precast, and this is their form. You can also get those aesthetics using form liners. And form liners, say, you know, you've got a bed or you've got a form, and um, the form liners are made out of rubber or there's another material they make it out of. Fiber sand. Yeah. Um, but it, and it goes down into the bed or the form and then you pour your concrete and you can get so many I mean this is just a small selection of what can be achieved by using a form liner but you can see you can mimic the look of old wood you can mimic the look of tree bark of field stone slate 
Um, but the form liners really give uh, you that variety to choose from. Another thing that you can look at aesthetically is with veneers and thin brick. So precast can also be embedded with thin, what they call thin brick. Um, it's real brick, usually a half to th three quarters of an inch thick. It is also set into the forms and then the precast is cast over it. Um, it comes in literally all the shapes and sizes as your typical brick. Um, you can also include details such as soldier courses and headers. Um, this upper left picture is the Modern Art Museum in San Francisco and it is thin brick. And then this is actually that same, it's just a wall panel of that but close up. Um, again, this provides some of that beauty of the natural materials but with the speed and durability um, and other uh, benefits of high performance. So you can also veneer other natural materials onto um, precast such as limestone and granite. Now these aren't these aren't cast into the precast. They're actually attached exterior. There's a connection point and they're they're attached. And the same here with uh, marble and even glazed products can be attached to precast. We're going to take a real quick look at some oh nope, I got ahead of myself. So <clears throat> here's a single panel with a combination of finishes and this is the beauty of precast is that you can pour a single panel and you've got all these different elements within it. So um, the nice thing about that is you're reducing the number of joints and detailing required so you've got no flashing and detailing at the windowsill and trim and it also reduces your number of trays. So typically to get this look on the exterior of a building, you would have up to three trades, and this reduces it to a single trade in one monolithic panel. <coughs> so we're gonna take a real quick look at just some projects that integrate uh, precast. Um, this is a teen living center house in Chicago, Illinois. This is an office building, and you can see the same mix of concrete, just two different exposures of the underlying aggregate. <coughs> this is an, whoops, I skipped one. Nope, it didn't, I'm behind. Um, this is an example of a project using form liners. So as you can see, it's a county fair building, and they built this to look like an old time barn or fair building, and they got that look using form liners. The next one <clears throat> is an example of using um, pigment or color in the concrete and they designed a, a ribbon effect around this building using colored concrete. <clears throat> this also is a full precast building, um, not quite close enough that you can see the details, but the different colors, again the same mix of concrete but some different exposures and then some inlays, they've uh, polished this, these little brown things down here look like polished granite, but it is, it is all precast, it's just been polished. Um, here's a sculptural piece of precast that is uh, showing an application where precast can be used sculpturally as well. Okay, so we've looked at aesthetic versatility um, and design versatility. We're going to look at uh, structural versatility now. So looking at varying shapes and lobe points. And I'm going through this kind of quick because I want to leave some time so we can watch some videos. Um, <clears throat> so first, precast is a structural material. So your exterior envelopes can be designed to carry your floor and lo roof loads. We've talked about that. This eliminates the redundancy of another system for the same purpose. So you're saving material, time, and cost by using the same product. Um, the nice thing about precast is it also adds to your usable floor space, and that's really big when you're looking at, you know, when an owner's looking at how much floor space am I going to have to lease in this building. <clears throat> Another benefit is precast can also be made in all, literally almost any shape to fit the project needs, and it allows for those curved shapes. Precast concrete, um, again, we're using it in transportation. This is an example, again, of a long span curved U girder. And the pre stressing, again, allows for thinner and lighter cross sections 
you get the same um, load carrying capacity. So <clears throat> high performance materials and high performance structures, we're looking at the long term, but they should also be able to be re reused and adaptable after their, their current building life reaches its limit. So a couple of examples, precast can be recycled. So up here you've seen it being crushed into road grade, or I'm sorry, road base. Um, precast elements are all individually engineered, so they can be disassembled and reused in different projects in either an expansion or a different project altogether. And in this, they use some elements to expand this stadium, um, some existing elements that were already in place. This is one of four high school stadiums in Georgia that were um, built using the disassembled 1996 um, Olympic Stadium in Atlanta. Um, high performance structures provide for changes in use. So once, a lot of times the, the intended use of a building will expire before the usefulness of a building will. And so the nice thing about precast is um, it provides for those larger open spaces so, so buildings use can be adapted to something else as needs change. So because precast is made off-site, other work can commence on the project while the panels are being made, while the, the entire project is being made. So foundations can be poured and ready to go for when the panels arrive on site. Um, since precast arrives ready to install, there's nothing to do on site other than setting up the crane and setting the pieces into place. It requires no or minimal staging on site. Um, no storage, no lay down areas. So again, you're reducing your site footprint using precast. And then also precast doesn't have any of this. It does not contribute to waste or dust on your project site. So as I just said a minute ago, precast is literally erected with a crane and a very small crew. Um, again, maintaining that small project footprint. It can also be erected in almost any weather. Um, you're reducing delays and allowing for a quicker project completion in most cases. Again, one of the fastest building materials available. So high performance structures must also operate efficiently and use their energy consumption when compared to baseline codes. So we're going to look at a couple of energy things here real quick. So when looking at um, the building envelope, for an envelope to be thermally efficient, it has to provide many things, starting with protection from bulk moisture um, intrusion. So precast concrete is space sealed or a barrier system. And the low cement to water ratio um, makes it low permeability and, I'm sorry, the low permeability and the high strength makes it easy to resist bulk rainwater and moisture. Um, so there are quite a few advantages of this system as opposed to a cavity wall system. Typically, it's more cost effective. Um, precast eliminates cavities where moisture problems may go undetected until it's too late. And also if there are problems, they can be detected faster and uh, repaired easier and, and less expensively. So also on a thermally efficient envelope, um, they have to manage your heat, your air, and your vapor, vapor your moisture vapor. I've done this twice today, so I'm starting to uh, run words together. So a lot of the codes, and I don't know how much you guys have gotten into codes yet, so codes like ASHRAE 90 require continuous insulation in most climate zones. It certainly does here in Illinois. Most precast systems inherently provide that continuous insulation from edge to edge. So they meet that ASHRAE uh, 90.1 requirement. Also, precast wall systems are easily scalable, so they can allow for different thicknesses of insulation. So precast wall systems are easily scalable, allowing for your different uh, insulation thicknesses. The 2012 International Energy Conservation Code, which is the current code, also requires a continuous air barrier. 
And again, precast concrete is that air barrier. There's no measurable leakage, so meets that requirement. All right. My computer has decided to quit. Um, so another concern in envelopes is thermal bridging. And you can see by the top example, this is a steel stud wall cavity system. Um, and you can see how it is acting as a thermal bridging. And what it's doing is reducing the R value of the insulation that's in that wall. That's an R19 uh, wall insulation. And because of thermal bridging, it's really reduced it to about an R9 value. Um, most precast systems use composite or coated connectors, which practically eliminate your thermal bridging. Um, helps reduce your cold spots, condensation potential, etc. So when the R it goes from 19 to 9, that's mm -hmm. not good. Not good. Not good. And so you can see here, there's literally no examples of thermal bridging. Okay. So thermal mass. Um, Precast concrete is, one of its greatest attributes is thermal mass, and I always talk about like the adobe concept, I mean it absorbs heat and then it holds it and slowly releases it, um, and there's many reasons why this is a benefit, um, and you can see here on this chart you have a couple of different, you have a metal wall frame, a wood wall frame, and then this curve here is your precast. So, it's absorbed the heat and it's slowly releasing it over that 24 hour time period. Um, and reduces the magnitude of those uh, peaks and it, what it, bottom line is, is it uses less energy to heat and cool the structure. Another uh, good attribute of precast is it uses, it reduces the use of other materials. So um, drywall. A lot of projects are now finishing the interior when the precast is poured on a bed. That bed is so smooth and slick that, that it mimics interior drywall. So you can use your precast interior wide of concrete to paint right on like you would drywall. Um, the other nice thing about this, okay, so you've eliminated the use of drywall, but you've eliminated the labor and the cost to um, put in drywall. You've also, by not having drywall, you've eliminated the potential for mold in a, in a project. So another thing that high performance structures really focus on is reducing the life cycle cost, um, which means they should also reduce your maintenance cost on a building. So since precast is very durable, it, it doesn't rot, it doesn't rust, it doesn't require painting. Uh, it doesn't degrade in the presence of moisture, it's resistant to sunlight, it resists pests. All of that adds up to decreased maintenance. So precast systems also reduce your construction complexity. So this should be interesting to those of you, and we've kind of talked about it and touched on it briefly, that as project managers, construction project managers, um, a lot of times you're in charge of all those subcontractors on a job. And that inherently comes with a lot of construction complexity and a, a, a lot of risk when you're managing three or four or five or ten um, subcontractors on a job. So the nice thing about precast, as we've talked about before, is in one single panel, you, you've got a single subcontractor that's taking the place of three other subcontractors. So it's kind of a nice benefit there. One thing that we always talk to, whether you're a construction project manager, a general contractor, um, we ha start having these conversations with the owners and with the architects, is to get your precast producer involved in the process early, because a lot of times, and this is not a knock on architects, but architects have these great ideas, they're going to build this monumental building, and you know people are going to drive by it and go, ooh, ah, but sometimes what they design is not feasible. And so it's extremely important to work with your precaster so that you know what is feasible in the design. And so that's not only 
you know, it's good for you, the project manager to know what's uh, possible with the precaster. It's good for the general contractor. So we just like to say, get, get your precaster involved early. So the final thing we're going to look at is resiliency. So how long is a structure going to be durable? This is the Baha'i Temple here in Illinois. Um, it's over 60 years old and probably closer to 90 because they actually began this, um, the um, construction on this building in like 1920, late 1920s. So this just gives me an example. This is a complete precast building and we see a lot of the ornate details. Um, but 90 years old, so the durability is there. Um, high performance structures should provide multi-hazard protection. Um, and resiliency, when we talk about resiliency, it's kind of a newer concept that goes beyond, a lot of people use resiliency and durability interchangeably, but we're talking about resiliency in the manner of Resistance to natural and man-made disasters, so earthquakes, blasts, um, hurricanes, we're in tornado country here, um, so we're looking at that, but we're also looking at how long it takes to rehab a building to get it up to use again. So what resources and how fast can a building be restored to full function after disaster? So that's what we're kind of talking about when we talk about resiliency. So what we're going to do now is look at a couple of videos real quick. And we're going to take a quick look at impact testing and how precast holds up to a tornado-like simulation. The footage you have just seen demonstrates the performance of various wall systems when exposed to flying debris thrown by hurricane and tornado force winds. In recent years, tests have been conducted at the Wind Engineering Research Center at Texas Tech University. Using these accepted procedures, you will see four distinct systems tested at ground speeds ranging from 70 to over 100 miles per hour. In this first test, we see the 2x4 striking vinyl siding on a 2x4 wood frame with R13 interior insulation. The exterior portion has 3 quarter inch sheathing and the interior portion has half inch drywall. As you can see from this test, debris striking a home made from this type of wall panel offers very little resistance to the forces of nature. In this second test, we see the effects of debris impacting a brick veneer on a 2x4 wood stud frame with R13 interior insulation. The exterior portion has 3 quarter inch sheathing and the interior portion is half inch drywall. This was a conventionally built wall with brick veneer. In this third test, we demonstrated the effect of debris impacting on a brick veneer with a 2x6 steel stud frame. Again, it's R13 interior insulation. The exterior portion has 3 quarter inch sheathing. The interior portion, half inch drywall. This was a conventionally built section with brick veneer, typical in commercial construction projects. As you see in this video clip, the damage from the impact is very dramatic. In this final demonstration, the 2x4 is propelled at tornado force speeds in a typical precast concrete wall panel. This was a double wall panel, two and a half inches of concrete sandwiching three inches of insulation for a total panel thickness of eight inches. The blast resulted in no breakage or cracking. The insulated precast concrete wall panel offers impressive resistance to the flying debris. We conducted these tests at our manufacturing facilities and also demonstrated them at the Fortified Home Project in Bolingbrook, Illinois. The group on hand for the field demonstration included a number of engineers and architects. Okay, so that kind of gave you an idea of, should you have a tornado, the difference between your typical construction and precast construction, and how it holds up to those tornado force winds. Let's take a quick look at what an earthquake would look like on precast. 
So I'm gonna, this is a 15 minute video, so I'm gonna skip to the relevant part, which I think is around 11. The model is real size. Uh, we are going to uh, simulate this um, uh, uh, scenario with a record obtained during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake in, in, in San Francisco or nearby. And this has very high uh, velocity pulse in fact has five pulses, one, two, three, four, five. So the structure is going to be very severely shaken. The team is ready to proceed into uncharted territory, the Berkeley design based test. Replicating forces experienced close to the Hayward Fault maybe once in 475 years. PCI 6, 100%, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ready. time for the most extreme test ever conducted on such a massive concrete structure. The Berkeley Maximum Considered Earthquake. One we have little chance of experiencing, or so we hope. ECI 100%, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, running. In the end, all settles and the structure stands. Success. We have to check everything close up, but uh, it, it looked like it performed really well, so we're, we're excited. The test phase is complete. With the task of transforming the results into practice ahead, Robert Fleischman comments on how the structures perform. So that kind of gives you guys an idea of what we're talking about when it comes to resiliency. So, I mean, no lie, when you saw the precast crack at the base when they did the next to highest seismic test, but the, the key there is that it didn't collapse. And so we also have another uh, video we're not going to watch today, but you can always go up to PCI.org and watch any of these videos. There's also a video where they've looked at um, blast resistance, so bombings, right? I mean, with the uh, age of terrorism and, and um, acts like that, we're always interested in how is a man-made disaster going to impact a building. So there's a, a, a video on that as well on the PCI website. So that gives you an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about resiliency. So to carry on with our um, PowerPoint, um, so we've looked at structure durability, multi-hazard protection. Um, high performance structures also have to provide a safe and healthy indoor environment. And precast contributes positively to this in several ways. Um, it does not emit VOCs or provide a, a food source for mold like drywall does. Um, the fast enclosure of the building, because precast can be erected so quickly, um, helps reduce your exposure to moisture and contaminants. Um, again, it's an excellent sound insulator. Um, I think, oh, the other thing about precast I want to touch on is um, the inherent passive fire protection. So most of the codes now require buildings to have at least two hours of fire protection and precast does that inherently. You so mean it stands fire for two hours without collapsing. Yes. Okay, so real quick, because I think you only have about twenty minutes of class time left and I know we want to leave some time for questions or talking. Um, so every PCI member and PCI plant is PCI certified and basically what that means I'm going to go through this really quick give you a high level so 
PCI is the organization, it's an institute. Uh, the I in PCI stands for institute. They are our body of knowledge. They are the ones that spend all of their money, time, and resources on research, technical uh, resources. So they know how a high performing quality product should look. And so they have a certification program in place that allows every one of these manufacturing plants to produce that high quality product. Whether it's a, the flag sculpture, whether it's a load bearing um, interior wall, exterior wall, whether it's the pretty outside sculptural architect, every single piece that comes out of a PCI plant is, is, goes through the certification process. So every PCI um, certified plant manufacturing plant has a quality assurance program and a quality control program and I don't know when you went to county did you happen to see like their lab room or their quality control room at all we do the okay so every plant has like a <coughs> lab somewhere and again I think I told you guys at the beginning I mean this, the, these plants production range from ginormous indoor facilities that are extremely nice to outdoor facilities where they're pouring gray structural concrete um, Every one of them, though, has to take samples every day of every pour so, and, and be sent in for testing. And then twice a year, every PCI certified plant is um, audited by an independent outside engineer, and it's an unannounced audit. So it, you have to have all of these things in place. And so there's also different levels of certification. So just because a producer can build a really pretty um, architectural piece of concrete does not mean that they're certified nor qualified to build a bridge. So that's why we have the different, let's see, go to the next one. That's why we have these different levels of certification. So we have A, which is architectural, um, B, which is all the bridge materials, um, C is hollow core stairs, I mean all the different elements you're going to see. Um, and then G is glass fiber reinforced concrete. So there's different levels of certification within the overall certification. Why this is important to you guys as potential project managers is when you get your project specs and you get your blueprints, it's going to say right on there, this is, you know, PCI certified, it's spec'd out. So the PCI certified project is spec'd by AIA Master Spec. It is spec'd by the General Services Administration, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, um, over 32 departments of transportation, and the Federal Highway Administration. All of them spec certified precast concrete. So I think with that, we're not going to do a review, and I think I'll just close it up because um, these last slides are just summaries and kind of open it up for the class and whatever the professor has. Great. Now, uh, for all of us are writing part of the uh, project. Um, before I say what I'm going to say, would you please thank our speaker? <laughs> We are working on the PAM item thing, and uh, we are having extension time to for us for anybody who needs more time to uh, tweak and the, uh, the his report or her report. Uh, I suggest you add uh, an element of precast based stress concrete uh, thing in the PAM items. Meaning, if you are talking about site, I'm not sure who is taking the site. You want to add uh, to your paper that special case precast based stress concrete the site. The site in this particular fascinating material is the site where the materials are, or members or elements are being built. And then the site management where uh, the project is really constructed. And then in between those who are talking about transportation, if that's uh, part of your report, talk about how you transport all these pieces uh, safely to the place. So uh, just uh, think about how to be innovative to have <coughs> a new report about precast precast concrete, how to manage whatever the type, uh, talking about money, for example, uh, don't talk about uh, it uh, needs more budget to start with, 
but it saves you money later on in maintenance and so forth. So you want to touch on managing money that maybe as a project manager you would advise the owner, sir, I uh, recommend that you take this, although you'll pay more now, but at 10 years, you have saved 75% or 25% or whatever you say. So it's in the long run, it's, it's better. So please add this element. Now, any questions you have for her very quickly, if you like? Any yes. I'm the executive director of the Precast Concrete Institute of Illinois and Wisconsin. So PCI is the national organization, and then it's arranged in nine different regions. And I manage the region of Illinois and Wisconsin. There's Northeast, there's Central, there's Midwest, um, California, Georgia, or the Georgia and the North Carolinas. So there's nine of us. Now, to organize our thoughts, I'm going to email you the sheets for a report about the guest speaker. I didn't get a chance to prepare them for you, so I'll email it to you today. So anything that she said, PowerPoint or in our discussion, I'll put this in the D12. So look for this. So if you missed anything, you can be recreated. And write us something good about this because I consider precast, precess, concrete, the material for 21st century, and it is really neat to work with it. It's very high paying job, I guess, for anybody who gets into that. Uh, and a very clean thing to work with because uh, in the plant, if you end up being project manager for the site, it's under a closed environment, doing something nice. Even the forms that you use are kind of like furniture. They are very deliberately done and, uh, and so forth. If you are working in the open air also, you have seen that in, uh, in Champaign and other places. Um, so I'm sending you page one and two together, so please complete them and bring them uh, with you next time. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, does it cost more to transport all the precast to the job site? Because I know if you have like big pieces, can you only carry a couple at a time? So is it? Right. Does it cost more money to like transport? So to so, that? yes. Versus like the traditional. Board? Yeah. So yes, it does because you're transporting it there. But remember, we talked a lot about you're also reducing all your other trades. So a couple of things, so the architectural precast that has your exterior wise of the nice finish, whether it's brick, marble, whatever, those have to be shipped standing up. They can't be stacked because um, you don't want to damage them. So they have to be shipped standing up. Um, your, a lot of your structural elements can be, you know, dependent upon the size of it and they arrange this. I mean, you can get more than one piece on a truck. Um, they do have a system now in a trailer now that, um, loads them at a diagonal so that you get rid of, you're, you're safe in both your height and your width and you don't have to go special permitting. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is a transport cost that is included with precast, which, you know, we talked a little bit in the first hour class about inherently at the, or at the front end, precast may come with a higher price tag. Um, not so much that it should scare anybody away from the project because when you again factor in all those different trades that you're having to pay for and um, take on the risk of you're saving money but then when you look at the long-term benefit of precast knowing you're going to have a long life cycle you're going to have reduced maintenance cost it's the long-term picture where you're going to save money so but yes there's a cost in transporting the product and if I may add here, just a tip for everybody here, if you want to make a comparison between the, the cast in place uh, and the, uh, the precast thing, take, for example, an element like the stairs we saw. Make a list of what you do to, to cast uh, stairs for two flights. In the, so it, it needs to be formed, formed to be there, and the uh, reinforcement be put, and the concrete will be ordered and poured and cured. So you uh, make a list Labor. of this. Of vapor, everything. Now make a list of the others. Yes, you have transportation of the stairs, but you will transport your materials not to the site, to the plant. And then you have control, no waste in the material. It's under control. The time, if it rains, no problem. You are going in the, in, in, in the on schedule. If it rains in the site, you can't do anything because it's raining, you can't do anything. So uh, this must be considered in the feasibility study, if you like, of comparison. And then uh, it's very valuable that today is Tuesday, for example, or Wednesday. Tomorrow you can have your stairs in place. 
you can do that with, uh, inside. So this has value on it. Yes, pay and pay more for the transportation, but I am ready to go at the upper state. Right, so right. The, the money that's gained in the speed of construction and having a building that's enclosed and ready to go within, you know, when you compare eight months of traditional construction to six weeks to two months of precast construction, how much money was saved, so. And enough that when you strip the forms, you put your, heart, your hand in your heart and say, oh, I have some bad concrete here. The concrete didn't uh, do cover here or something. But in that, it's ready. Just open and put. You have another question? Yeah. And that list of companies, uh, uh -huh. what was that for? Those are the only certified ones? Right. Those are the only certified. Those are members of PCI in Illinois and Wisconsin. And they're the only certified production facilities in Illinois and Wisconsin. It's very, right. There's 15. There's 15 precast producers. Now there are two new producers that are in the certification process, but it takes to, up to almost two years. It takes 18 months to two years for a new production plant to receive their certification. I mean, you know, everybody says, "Oh, I'm certified, and I got the good housekeeping stamp of approval, or whatever, or I'm consumer rated." The PCI certification is serious, and it's a long-term process. So somebody, you know, has several hundred thousand dollars and they want to start up a precast production plant, they have to, I mean, it takes two years almost to get certified. So, um, but so I should have two new members here though within the next six to eight months. So, no, yeah. uh, Dorian is working on providing a free membership for students to become mem student members free of charge just to get you started and get their uh, applications in the mail and be connected to their activities. So you, you have this in your arsenal, in your resume, that you are educated in this. It gives value to the resume to, to just drop in the name that precast piece as concrete. So you have a, a step or two steps ahead of anybody else that doesn't have this experience. So uh, she will tell me when this is ready and you get the form so you become a member. Uh, by the way, I want to introduce you to our construction club president and who is the vice president. So we have construction club here. Oh, cool. uh, they are much interested in this. Interest in this. So okay. we'll talk about that in the construction club as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, which one of you was the president? Oh, very cool. Good. So, uh, anything else? Any question? I have an announcement for next week, if I may. Uh, uh, we have four classes to go for the semester, and please make sure to be at uh, this.